month event in the library. I hope that you've uh, been paying attention to some of the other things that Africana Studies and others have been sponsoring in honor of Black History Month, but we're especially pleased and honored to have our speaker today uh, for today's special event. And I will turn the podium now over to Dr. Crystal Lucky to make an introduction of our speaker. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Crystal Lucky. I'm the director of the Africana Studies Program. And I'd first like to thank Joe Lucia and Darren Poley and the Falvey Memorial Library staff for their commitment to sponsoring interesting and quality Black History Month programming. We've been working together for the last few years and it's been wonderful. Um, Africana Studies is delighted with this partnership and we're looking forward to many more years of celebration and exploration. So we want to say thank you for your sponsorship. And then we'd also like to thank the History Department under the leadership of Professor Mark Galicchio and the Office of Multicultural Affairs directed by T Dr. Terry Nance for their co-sponsorship and generous support of this event. Well, to say that we're in the presence of greatness is understatement. I feel like a gushing teenager and have felt like that for the last day or so being with our speaker today, Dr. Darlene Clark Hine who is Board of, Trust, Board of Trustees Professor of African, um, of African American Studies and History at Northwestern University. Her work as a leading historian of the African American experience has helped to found the field of black women's history, for she has been one of its most prolific scholars. By reclaiming the lived experiences of black women and men, Professor Hine has helped to open the proverbial historical door for so many scholars of all races who are following behind her, and I might add, in various uh, disciplines. She received her PhD in history at Kent State University in 1975, and since that time, she's been moving forward ever since. The winner of numerous honors and awards, her publications authored, edited, and co-authored are too numerous to list entirely. Along with a host of essays, Professor Hine has published The African American Odyssey, Black Victory, The Rise and Fall of the White Primary in Texas, Black Women in White, Racial Conflict and Cooperation in the Nursing Profession, 1890 to 1950, The Harvard Guide to American History, Hindsight, Black Women and the Reconstruction of American History, More Than Chattel, Black Women and Slavery in the Americas, A Question of Manhood, A Reader in U.S. Black Men's History and Masculinity, A, shrine, a Shining Thread of Hope, the History of Black Women in America, Speak Truth to Power, Black <coughs> Professional Class in United States History. We specialize in the holy and possible, a reader in black women's history. And one of my personal favorites, Black Women in America, an historical encyclopedia, now published by Oxford University Press in three volumes, as opposed to the, two, the original two volumes that I proudly own. Um, it is a tome of an experiment, and you want to get your copy quickly. She has been awarded fellowships and grants by the American Council of Learned Societies, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, the Ford Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Humanities Center, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Here to share ideas about her new work on three South Carolina women, I am overjoyed to present Professor Darlene Clark Hine. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lucky. That is such a generous and gracious introduction. And you do my heart proud. I'm so proud of you and all that you have accomplished and your leadership of Africana Studies here at Villanova. And I also want to echo what you said about expressing appreciation to uh, the library and the library staff and faculty. Um, I couldn't do the work that I do were it not for the librarians and the archivists all over the country. And so historians simply cannot ever, ever pass up an opportunity to thank a library and a librarian for supporting their work. And so I just want 
you to know I'm very, very happy to be here. And I'm so happy to see all the students here. Um, what I'm going to do with uh, this, this um, project, it's a new book project that I've been working on for about seven years. I probably have a, a little bit more time to spend with it. And it focuses on, on three women who uh, made a difference in South Carolina history. And um, I've been experimenting with different ways of presenting uh, this work to uh, students and audiences and what have And so today, the way I'm going to present it, is I'm going to show you some slides of the women. So you don't have to use your imagination to imagine what they look like. You can see what they look like and say a few words introducing them. Um, and then after that, I'm going to target one woman in particular and give a rather uh, detailed reading of what I think are some of the major contributions that she made to this era um, before, this era of struggle before Brown. And um, during the question and answer period, if you are curious and want more information about the first two women, then we can we can uh, continue the conversation and explore their lives. But we're trying to pack a lot of information into a very short period of time. So like a good historian, let me start by reading a couple of paragraphs to essentially tell you what my argument is. You know. What is your argument? What, what's the point you're trying to make with this research project? This uh, rehearsal for freedom in black country, uh, essentially looking at the lives of three, black, of three women, one white and two black. After nearly two centuries of slavery in South Carolina, freedom meant a great deal to those who were liberated in the early 1860s. For a brief time, slavery's end seemed to promise genuine citizenship, political rights, and economic self-sufficiency. Northern white and black missionaries and educators hurried to South Carolina during the Civil War to assist the freed people. In her classic study, Rehearsal for Reconstruction, the Port Royal Experiment, historian Willie Lee Rose documented their noble as well as their cynical efforts to prepare and educate formerly enslaved men and women. But the promises of emancipation soon became a cruel mockery with the collapse of Reconstruction in 1877. South, Carolina, <coughs> South Carolina's white Democrats forcefully redeemed the state and proceeded over the next several decades to disfranchise black men as they imposed segregation and white supremacy on the state's black population. So, in the wake of the failed Reconstruction, black and white women, I argue, performed crucial roles in another, a second rehearsal. This one aimed at the retrieval of freedoms so recently lost and in the adjustment to an increasingly restrictive system of racial oppression. The second rehe rehearsal was a process of community building and self-reliance that shaped the everyday life in the black, uh, the everyday lives of black people in the black majority counties. Now, let me pause and explain what I mean by black majority counties. For those of you who are familiar with Peter Wood's book called Black Majority, you know that for most of its history, South Carolina 
had a population that was overwhelmingly black, that blacks outnumbered uh, whites in South Carolina for the first couple hundred years of its existence. And indeed, the black population did not fall below the white population until after the Great Migration by 1926, you then had a black, a white majority in the state of South Carolina. But uh, that was after 200 some thousand black people had migrated out of the state. So I called, I called this era that I'm talking about black country and the area that I'm talking about black country in particular because several of the counties in South Carolina remain black majority counties. And even today, although whites outnumber blacks in the general population of the whole state, there are several counties in South Carolina that still have a black majority population. Okay. So the second rehearsal then, the second rehearsal stars three intrepid, unique, and remarkable black and white women. Martha Schofield, Matilda A. Evans, and Maude Callan. Through their individual and collective consciousness, their work and vision, these women facilitated and inspired the development of institutions in education, health care, and social welfare that proved essential to the survival of black people during the era of Jim Crow. Each worked to lead and to assist African Americans through the labyrinth of white supremacy. Each woman engineered complex constructions, transparent and opaque, of racialized gender identities that they respectively rehearsed and performed as social conditions and forces dictated. This trio of black country women are linked by a shared central agenda to wit, to win for black people the rights of full freedom as well as to adapt, manipulate, and eventually to end the overarching system of apartheid and racial violence. So, their struggles, I argue, were a prelude to the modern freedom movement that would capture center stage in South Carolina and in the nation in the 1950s and 1960s. So that's, that's my argument. Now let's turn to the first of, of these women. Martha Schofield, born in 1839 um, in Newton, Pennsylvania, joined the ranks of teachers and ministers and reformers who went to South Carolina after the Civil War. Following stints on several of the sea islands, she came down with a bad case of malaria, threatened her life. She decided not to return to Pennsylvania, but to move inland in South Carolina, away from the coast. So she settled in Aiken, South Carolina. And there, this ardent believer in peace woman suffrage and temperance established in 1898 what would become the Schofield Normal and Industrial School. The motto of the school was not for ourselves alone. The early years of the school. <coughs> This, these are really bad photos, but this is the best that, you, that uh, we could do with these images. And Martha Schofield is here, and you can see that it's an interracial staff. Um, of, uh, these are some of the teachers and uh, people who 
help to tend to the, uh, the children and also to work some of the industries that the, uh, manage some of the industries that this school established. This is one of the most unique black schools I've ever encountered. Martha Schofield not only stressed uh, education in, uh, in the arts and reading and writing and that kind of, uh, but she also stressed vocational uh, education. And she was very, very important in organizing conferences of farmers in South Carolina where she would bring them to the school and, pe and essentially preach uh, certain lessons like the importance of land ownership, the importance of, uh, of, of not renting and leasing, the importance of living frugally. Uh, the, I mean, she, and she would turn the uh, conventions over to the men who had expertise. She hired people from Tuskegee Institute to, uh, to work. And in addition to this school that she established, she also uh, operated a farm so that the students who came to Schofield School essentially did a work study uh, kind of arrangement. They worked on the farms because everybody had to pay. This was, uh, you pay 25 cents uh, a week or a month, rather, <coughs> or uh, $2 a year, whatever you could afford. She wasn't trying to get rich, but she was trying to teach the importance of investing in yourself and investing in your education and also if you could not work then you help to clean the buildings or you help to work uh, on the farms and she opened a print shop uh, and she taught um, printing that proved to be a very lucrative activity and each year there's another thing that she did she operated a store an annual store each year People in Philadelphia and throughout Pennsylvania, because the Quakers were there, the Society of Friends were very well organized, would send barrels of old clothing and other instruments and implements, just barrels and barrels of stuff, to Martha Schofield. And some of the students and some of the members in the community would repair these old clothing and repair the implements. And each year, Martha Schofield would organize a store. It was like a store. Some of us would call it a fair. And people from all over the county could come and purchase the items that they needed for a nickel or for a dime or whatever. Because she didn't want to teach charity. She thought that people valued whatever they had to pay for. And so this institution that she created was quite lucrative. And during the course of a year, uh, by the 1890s, by the 1890s, she was bringing into Aiken $10,000 a year in revenue. Uh, so the white business people who had first been disinclined to embrace her uh, saw that she was in adding to the economy of Aiken, South Carolina. And anytime women can add to the economy uh, by infusing a little bit of money, sometimes they're looked upon more favorably. Now, this was her public face, but she had a private side. She had a private side. She was a feminist. She ardently supported uh, the suffrage movement and she was a temperance worker. Uh, and as a matter of fact, she's better known in women's history circles as temperance, uh, as, as a leader in the temperance, women's temperance uh, movement. So, and she was very anti-racist. And some of her letters, I don't think she really mailed these letters, but I did happen to read them over at Swarthmore College. She told people exactly what she thought about the racial policies of, uh, of Southern uh, states' leaders, especially the governors and the, the hate mongers in South Carolina. But publicly, you would never have known that she was anything but this mild-mannered, Northern Quaker woman, soft-spoken, wouldn't hurt a flea, just down there doing the, you know, the work to help God's uh, lost and forgotten and 
you know, uh, belittled people, to lift them up. Uh, and what I argue in my larger study is that Schofield, with this school, actually helped to create the black middle class in South Carolina. Very important members of the black middle class in South Carolina. So that's Martha Schofield. This is one of the most prominent graduates <coughs> of Schofield School. And this is Matilda Evans, who was born in 1872 in Aiken, South Carolina. And as a very young girl, Martha Schofield discovered her. And she was impressed with her because she wanted to come to school and she was one of the hardest working little girls that uh, Martha Schofield had seen. And <coughs> you, you've heard the story of people working them way through co their, their way through college. You know, Matilda worked her way through grammar school. That's how hard working she was. And so Martha Schofield embraced the little girl and took her on their arm and became a fierce mentor of, of this child. So she and her mother, uh, guardian, grandmother, eventually moved to Aiken so that, I um, mean, near the school, so that the grandmother could work in the school and uh, Matilda could finish her um, grammar school education. At, after she finished her years at, Schof at uh, Schofield School, Martha Schofield arranged for her to go to Oberlin College. Okay. So she went to Oberlin and she finished, I don't think she graduated from Oberlin, but she finished, she stayed up there for three and a half years more. After she left Oberlin, she came back and taught for a year at Schofield School. She taught for one year at Schofield School, then she went over across the border and taught at Lucy Laney School. Now Lucy Laney created Payne's Institute. Lucy Laney and Martha Schofield were best friends. So Lucy Laney is the black counterpart working in Savannah, creating the same kind of institution that Martha Schofield was doing in um, Aiken, South Carolina. And many of their students would go back and forth, but at least Matilda Evans taught one year at each institution. And then Matilda Evans, through Martha Schofield, was able to secure a fellowship well, a grant from a benefactor in Philadelphia that enabled her to attend medical school. So she came up to the Women's Medical College in Philadelphia and completed her the whole course of study. In 1898, 1898, Matilda Evans returned to South Carolina and immediately, because she's very smart as well as hardworking, she passed the medical examination and she became the first licensed black woman physician in the state of South Carolina. I don't know who the first white woman licensed physician was, so I can't say with certainty that she was the first woman uh, licensed physician in South Carolina but she certainly was a very unique professional. Within a year of being there, after getting herself established, in 1901, she opened the hospital and started a nursing training school. Matilda Evans was probably one of the most brilliant surgeons um, in, in the state of South Carolina. She was also, and this is what sets her apart, from all other black physicians that I've studied in, in um, uh, South Carolina and really throughout the country. She had a very large white clientele. White women really supported her and became her patients 
And she was very happy about that because you know what? The white women paid her for her medical services. And that enabled her to treat the black women and their children free. So she was very successful and very important in helping to ameliorate the suffering and the conditions of black people in, the, in South Carolina. Now why is the hospital important? Columbia, South Carolina had a population of over 25,000 people, most of whom, or a good percentage of whom, uh, were black. And there was not one hospital open to black people. And so having this hospital allowed her then to treat all the work, the injuries of the workers. And some of the railroad men actually uh, contributed and raised funds. Uh, and some of the businessmen in South Carolina uh, gave her contributions. Why? Because they didn't want black people coming to those other hospitals. And they had to go somewhere. And so why not? And through all of this, again, like her mentor, she appeared to be a model of perfection. She never raised her voice. She never uh, was snappy. She never seemed to be disagreeable or spiteful. She simply went about her work performing all of these great services. Well, in 1916, Matilda Evans' great mentor died. Martha Schofield died. And a few months after Martha Schofield died, Evans privately published a biography of Martha Schofield. A biography of Martha Schofield. This clearly has to be the first time in American history that a black woman writes a biography of a white woman and publishes it. And of course, uh, it is a very, very, very peculiar biography. <laughs> <laughs> the first half of it uh, talks about what a Saint Martha was. You know, um, she surely was an angel. Everybody loved her. She talked about how brave she was, how ferocious she was, how wonderful, and what have you. And all of that is true, right? From her, literally saved her. But the second half of this biography, this very peculiar biography, makes you wonder what's going on here. Because in the second half, she says all kinds of things that even in 2000, you know, 2008 would be radical uh, at, along, as far as the races are concerned. But she says, Martha Sofia believed these things. Like one of the things she believed, according to Matilda Evans, was that black people should have their own state, right? And uh, because white people didn't treat them well and was disfranchising and violent and hateful and spiteful and whatever. And so for racial harmony, they should create a state in the West, confiscate all this land. The federal government could through eminent domain. Black people could elect all of their own officials. And uh, after a certain period of time, could be in a recognized state, you know, like the uh, like Alaska or something. Well, anyway, she said, but Martha Schofield said that white people could come and live in the state, but they couldn't vote. <laughs> now, if this is an, an, an expression of nationalism, of I'm sort of fed up with what's going on here, and while I'm taking all of this, um, um, bad treatment and black people have to be obsequious and all of that. It, the biography suggests that she was not very thrilled with the way <laughs> things were going. And at some point she says, white people think that they were made of better clay than black people. But there's going to be a reckoning. And one of these days black people are going to get tired and rise up 
and white people should change their attitude to their ways before that happens. So, you know, being a good historian, I went up to Swarthmore to look through all of Martha Schofield's papers to see if she really did advocate Negro land. <laughs> I couldn't find any mention of it. But that doesn't mean it didn't, you know, she didn't think it. It's just that I could not find any written record. And um, so I'm suggesting that <coughs> Matilda Evans was using this biography almost as an act of ventriloquism. There were things that she wanted to say that she knew she could not claim authorship of. She could not own her true feelings and express them. It would risk what? Her career, her medical practice, the hospitals, and all the things that she was doing. But in 1930, five years before her death, Matilda Evans did do something quite remarkable. She organized the black citizens of Columbia, South Carolina, and she did it brilliantly, and presented to the State Board of Health and the state a request that the state provide free medical attention and inoculation for all of the black women and children in South Carolina, in Columbia in particular. In particular, all the school children be inoculated at state expense. This was the first time that she stood and said and preached this new gospel that the state should bear the responsibility for providing health care to its citizens and that health care was as much a citizenship right as is the right to a secondary, a primary and secondary education. And because she organized the churches and the women's clubs and all of the other black professionals and present this, uh, this demand in such a way, the state deemed it wise to accommodate and so in 1930, for the first time, um, they opened a clinic in the basement <coughs> of a church. All the black medical men were there, and 700 people arrived to be vaccinated, examined, inoculated. And I have a photograph that was taken on that day. I'm just going to pass it around of some of the people who came because Matilda Evans said come. Uh, and she died in 1935. They were unable to institutionalize and sustain the clinic because, of course, the Great Depression decimated um, uh, the state. But the point was lodged in people's minds that they could make demands on the state. They could make demands on the state. And health care was one of those demands. And this is the third woman. This is Maude Callan. And this is, this is the woman who inspires me <laughs> the most. And I will I will share my information about you, my essay about her. Um, but let me run through these photographs first, okay? So this is Maude Callan, born in 1898, Quincy, Florida, who moved to Pineville, South Carolina in 1923 and became the first licensed midwife in uh, South Carolina. And this was the mode of transportation in Pineville back in those days. Maude Callan used her nursing skills to service everybody in Berkeley County, a county of 10,000 people, and Maude Callan, for most of those people, was the only health care professional. As a midwife, 
she was unparalleled. Throughout the course of her career, she delivered over 700 babies, over 700 babies. And she was, you know, instrumental in training a lot of other midwives in the scientific, uh, the more modern techniques of birth delivery. Okay, and there she is teaching a midwife class. And she was also a great, um, you know, benefactress, if you, if you will, if that's a word. Uh, out of her own pockets, she gave money, she gave resources, she gave goods to the impoverished people in her community. And in this picture, she has just given these cute dresses to these barefoot little girls. That's the only time I've seen what Callan smile. But this captures uh, the generosity and the spirit of this woman. Okay? The pictures were taken by the most famous photographer in the world at the time, W. Eugene Smith. Uh, so let me tell you about Maud Callan. Am, am I doing okay as far as time? Okay. Maud Daniel Callan was born on November 8, 1898 in Quincy, Florida. Her parents, Harrison and Amanda Daniels, had 13 daughters, only three of whom survived, a testament to the precarious existence of black children. Before Amanda Daniels died, she requested that her brother, Dr. William John Gunn of Tallahassee, Florida, care for and educate her young daughter. Dr. Gunn welcomed the responsibility and enrolled the six-year-old Maud in St. Michael's and All Angels Parochial School in Tallahassee, Florida. He died in 1921, just as Maud was graduated from Florida A&M University. Maud married William Callan and completed her nursing training at the Georgia Infirmary in Savannah. When asked about the origins of her desire to become a nurse, Callan explained, quote, my grandmother was a midwife in the olden times and my mother was ill when I was a young girl. I used to give her medicines, and when she didn't want any, I just threw it out the window like she told me. <laughs> in 1923, the Callens settled in Pineville, South Carolina. For the next decade and a half, Maud worked as a missionary nurse under the auspices of the Protestant Episcopal Church. Maud Callan recalled her arrival in Pineville. I quote, I never thought I would be able to stay a week. Conditions were quite primitive. She added, there was no electricity, no gas, no cars, no paved roads, and no telephones. She would remain in Pineville until her death in 1990. Now, Pineville was a small village. It was 22 miles from the county hospital and 10 miles from the nearest physician. Callan, for most of the 10,000 Berkeley County residents, was the only accessible black health care professional. In 1936, <coughs> the state of South Carolina used funds secured through the Social Security Administration to employ public health nurses. So the director of the Berkeley County Health Department took this opportunity to hire Maud. He called Berkeley County, quote, a place populated by poverty, lack of adequate schools, and shortage of health services. So he, he, uh, he hires her in 1935, but she's been working there since 1923. 
and um, the Episcopal Church is paying her salary. They gave her and her husband a house. Uh, she and her husband immediately added a two-room uh, addition to the house, which served as a clinic for all of the people in the county, and it was open 24-7. But now in 1935, she has some resources. The church continues to assist her, though. Callan never waited for the patients to come to her. She made it her business to go to them. Initially, she concentrated on the challenge to vaccinate, to vaccinate rural school children. She recalled, and I quote, you see, nobody ever bothered the school and the children were there and had no vaccinations. And on several occasions in visiting, I would come across cases that I thought it needed attention or would report a case of TB or some kind of contagious disease. Soon, Callan organized a series of health clinics to disseminate nutritional information, materials about birth control. She also taught prenatal care and she helped identif uh, identify individuals suffering from venereal disease and tuberculosis. Her tireless efforts helped to curb outbreaks of influenza and smallpox. Callan's intelligence, her skill, and her, quote, proper personality enabled her to acquire intimate knowledge of all her clients and their families. She became the community's registrar. She tracked all the births and the various liaisons. She knew everyone, their ages, their kinfolk, their real names, and all the troubles they had seen. And out of her own pockets, she provided clothing for poor children. She regularly interceded on behalf of the blind, infirm, and mentally ill. She secured bail for jail releases, established cooperative professional relations with white health care colleagues and administrators. She mediated conflict and ignored their, their criticisms and their tendencies to blame the victims for their impoverished conditions. But Callan's work with black midwives had the greatest impact on the future health care prospects of Berkeley County and black country citizens. Her instructions informed and inspired poor rural midwives to forge new perceptions of their work. Gradually, as more participated in the rudimentary modernization or professional exercises, they became more proud of what they were doing. They overcame the accusations of incompetence and ignorance and danger. And I need, to, I need to just pause here and put this in context because you may not know that during this period, these early days uh, of the 20th century, as obstetricians were professionalizing and public health nursing was coming into the fore, um, there was a, a concerted campaign by some people to eliminate midwives from the country. Midwives were, were called uh, ignorant, they were called dirty, they were called incompetent, they were, you know, the scourge of the earth, if you listen to some of these reformers. Well, Maude Callan was one of those rare people who stood up and said, Midwives are not all that bad. All midwives need is proper training. So if we train them, if we teach them, then we can, you know, have midwives uh, deliver babies and have a carve a space for them within the health care hierarchy. Now the important thing to also note about this is that it was also the time when more and more middle class women were going into the hospitals. And in South Carolina, black women were not being allowed to come into these hospitals to deliver their babies. If you got rid of the midwives, then who was going to help? 
So these women were absolutely essential to uh, the well-being of, of black women in this state. And a lot of them also service in the white communities as well. So the midwives then become more professionalized under Mont Callan's tutelage. And because they're becoming better at what they do, the women, the pregnant mothers, are also improving uh, in their postnatal care and in their uh, in prenatal uh, observation of what they should be, how they should be taking, taking care of themselves. Maude Callan was the one that was, was the essential person to trigger this major transformation in South Carolina because the death rate uh, was, you know, had put South Carolina at the bottom, just the bottom, maybe above Mississippi. So it was very, very high as far as black uh, dying in birth uh, and what have you. But after her work, she did boast, quote, all our expectant mothers are given polio shots now, and they are glad to have them. We never have to persuade. We've taught them the good in typhoid shots, vaccinations against smallpox, and inoculations for uh, diphtheria. So she was actually saving a lot of um, uh, saving these people's lives. Okay. This is the turning point. 1950, and she's been working now through 1935, all the 40s. The record of improvement in South Carolina in terms of maternal and infant mortality is so phenomenal that South Carolina becomes a model for the nation. Its midwife training program is absolutely the best there, there is. This is where W. Eugene Smith comes in. Uh, w. Eugene Smith, as I indicated before, and I'm not exaggerating, he was one of the most influential he was the best, he was the most accomplished photojournalist in America, and he worked from Life magazine. And W. Eugene Smith wanted to know what happened in South Carolina, what ignited this transformation, that this state with the worst health care record would now have one of the best in terms of you know, midwife assisted uh, births and what have you. So he went on behalf of Life Magazine to South Carolina to find who was responsible for this. The larger world would have remained totally ignorant of Maude Callan had it not been for W. Eugene Smith. In December 1951, Life Magazine, Smith published an unprecedented 12-page photo essay about the life and work of Maud Callan. He made visible the accomplishments of a rural southern black woman professional to a conservative, but in this instance, remarkably responsive white American public. <laughs> After discovering Callan, Smith wrote a letter to his mother and he said, I think I have my new project. I presume this story, which I wish to carefully and tenderly do with taste and understanding, that I will be called sacrilegious in some quarters, banned in Boston, and hated in the South. It will be a story of a midwife, and it will probably be centered around a Negro. There will be the usual complaints of devoting so much space to Negroes, this is just too bad. Smith, however, encountered a surprising obstacle with this new project. He had to win Callan's consent to become his subject. Again, he wrote to his mother, I went to see Maude Callan 
I had not found the right person, but I turned back and asked if she minded my haunting her for six weeks. She truly did mind. <laughs> there was no false modesty. But I told her my own dreams, and finally she consented. She began to trust me, and when we walked, when we went around, she merely introduced me as, this is Mr. Smith, and he is working with me. Now Smith was daunted, to say the least. The most daunting part of this whole experiment or project was keeping up with Maud. She exhausted him. She wore the poor man out. With her long schedules up before dawn, working extending into the evenings, but he stayed the course and, quote, went everywhere with her. In the end, Smith confessed, I quote again, I could think of only one person I could compare her to, Albert Schweitzer. And when I saw Schweitzer, I realized she was incomparable. She is the greatest person I have ever known. She left an indelible imprint on me. Now most observers of some of the Smith photos that I showed you marveled over his mastery of the craft, his mastery of his craft, the staging, the lighting, the composition. But a shift in perspective is needed fully to appreciate the agency of his subject. Callan ingeniously scripted a counter-narrative about gender, race, class, and distributional inequalities in health care delivery. As she suggested to the photographer, the certain spaces and places as possible backgrounds for his pictures. She positioned her body, controlled her facial expressions, her gestures, and performed the work of nursing, counseling, and distributing gifts of dresses to barefoot little girls. Smith took scores of pictures of the midwife waiting endless hours for babies to be born. Pictures of Maud teaching, reading, and writing classes to adults and vaccinating hundreds of children in a single day. Telescoped her style and substance. To be sure, the Callan who eschewed public display of her life and work put on a masterful performance of race, gender, and class before Smith and his cameras. The subject spoke emphatically back to the photographer and helped to fashion her own image. Now, this is the end. In January 30th, 1952, Callan sent a letter to W. Eugene Smith thanking him for what he had done. Within a month, you see, after those pictures appeared, Americans and some foreigners, because people from Italy were also touched by these images, they sent her over $17,500 in contributions, nickels, dimes, quarters, and envelopes just addressed to the nurse in Pineville, you know? <laughs> and in this letter that she wrote to Smith thanking him, she also said, I am tormented. No doubt you were born under some regime not yet named. The miracle I call it, you so silently perform, shall be my death. Where did you come from? 
I can't find words to tell you how wonderful everything everybody has been to me and my work, but, but, so much controversy behind it. Callum was caught in the middle of contentious clamor of religious leaders on the one hand and the health department bureaucrats on the other, each claiming control over the money. She asked Smith his advice and confided that what she really wanted to use this money for, quote, was to have it as a community clinic, to, to use it to build a community clinic under health regulation and not run solely by them, triple underlining them. <coughs> Smith responded promptly, urging her to use the money as she desired. He explained that he had done the story to reveal the hypocritical reality of America's claim to be the so-called, quote, greatest country while maintaining a race-based system of unequal health care delivery to its black citizens. On April 16, 1953, there's another issue of Life magazine. This time, there's a photograph of a triumphant Maud Callum. Eugene Smith went back and took this photograph. And in this article, it's called Maud Callum Gets Her Clinic. Life readers donate $18,500 to nurse midwife of Pineville, South Carolina. And there's this picture of Maude Callan looking at the construction of her new 57 by 30 foot, 32 foot building. And the caption informs us that she had just declared, it isn't so big, but it looks like the Empire State Building to me. The Maude Callan Clinic of Berkeley County bore her name the symbolic significance not to be ignored for few, if any, public buildings in South Carolina bore the names of black men and women to signal that the state and public general population should acknowledge and value their contributions. And while the Maud Callan Clinic celebrated individual achievement and service, it underscored as well the unfinished revolution, meaning the collapse of the first reconstruction. Callan's performance signaled the end of the second rehearsal and the long struggle of freedom. For in 1954, just a year later, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the Brown decision, and the first of the five cases that made up the Brown decision was Briggs v. Elliott, which was filed in Clarendon County, South Carolina, right next door to <coughs> Berkeley County. In conclusion, as long as white physicians refuse to treat black patients with dignity and fairness, and as long as customary practice prohibited white women nurses from touching black men's bodies, and as long as the number of black male physicians remain insufficient to meet the surging demands, the black women health care providers mediated the horrific consequences of racial bias in medical and local health care systems. In the short run, arguably, black women, physicians, nurses, midwives, buttressed the separate and unequal health care system and thus helped to sustain Jim Crow segregation and discrimination. This was the downside of self-determination, of meeting needs by forming analogous institutions within their own communities. But what choice did they have? The people needed help, and South Carolina white women educator, white woman educator, and black woman physician, and the scores of nurses and the hundreds of midwives saved lives and kept well the bodies and the minds 
that would survive the second rehearsal, equipped and willing to complete the social revolution. Those bodies saved became the foot soldiers of the modern civil rights movement. Thank you. Oh, wasn't that fascinating? You know, that somebody was there and actually took the pictures of all of those women and children waiting to become inoculated um, at that Evans Clinic. Yes. First of all, I wanted to thank you. It's really a privilege to get to hear you speak. And uh, I really enjoyed your talk and learned a lot. Um, I, I can't say I, I know that much about South Carolina, but I feel like I have a special insight into some things now that I've never even really that. I was, I'm moved by the stories of all the women that you talked about. I guess I was especially moved by um, Matilda Evans, and I just had some questions, kind of basic. They're not advanced questions, I guess. But I wondered, you said she was one of the best surgeons in the state. Could you talk a little bit about what kind of uh, what kind of medicine did she practice in terms of who did she get to operate on and did she only treat women or did you know she, she treated did she treat men too? Yes, she she treated everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, the the hospital uh, the first year that it opened, I think she said she had about four hundred patients to come, and the set the second year was open, there were about six hundred. Uh, patients that came and um, a lot of black laborers worked in and this is a time when there's no workers insurance there's no essentially safety movement afoot to uh, uh, have safe uh, workplaces for uh, men who worked on the trains and in some of the uh, the industries in the area and when they were injured there was nowhere to take them, and uh, and and Mark, I mean Matilda Evans was the person. I mean, they could come to her hospital, and she would put them back together again. Uh, so she had a lot of poor uh, black men patients. I didn't <laughs> find any records indicating that she had white male patients, but a lot of uh, a lot of white women would not necessarily come to her hospital, but she would attend to them in their homes. Um, and she also had a private practice in her house, a very nice house in, um, in Columbia at this time, and people could come there. Uh, she also uh, traveled out in and but she didn't have to walk. She had a buggy and you know, nice automobile and what have you. Uh, she was very successful. She was just an amazing uh, success story that no one really ever thought about or, or discussed or until I started doing this research. And of course now people are very much interested in, in Matilda Evans and what she did. But uh, the amazing thing was that she did have that interracial clientele. And so people were asked, but this is segregation. Uh, we thought it was completely, you know, this is the black world and this is the white. Well, some levels of intimacy, um, segregation did not hold sway. Why would so many white women seek out her services? Aside from the fact that she was very, very skilled. Um, if you don't want your business put in the street, then perhaps it's best to have a woman physician. And so discretion, she's, she's also not part of your social circle. Okay? Um, and then some women just wanted a woman uh, to deal with some of their more intimate uh, issues. And she, she filled that bill. Now, she comes She's, she, you have to also understand that she is highly recommended. She has allies, and Martha Schofield is an ally who's vouching for her. So she's just not some you know, black woman physician who comes out of nowhere and sets up and is all altogether successful. Uh, she has, she's building upon a relationship. 
Um, can you talk a bit about just the process of recovery of these stories? How do you find these people? I mean, even though Maud Callan had this, I mean, twice, right? She had these spreads in Black Magazine, but her, her name has kind of dropped out of, yeah. dropped off the radar. So can you just talk a bit about that kind of Well, part of the, uh, the, uh, the difficult, there was great difficulty in researching the lives of Matilda Evans and um, Maude Callan because all of their papers were destroyed. Uh, I did track down Maud Callan's son because uh, she and her husband adopted and served as foster parents to about five kids. Um, and one, but one they did adopt. And he told me that there was a fire in the garage and, um, and so all of her papers were destroyed. So I had to depend upon memory and um, <coughs> newspaper clippings, um, Eugene Smith's recollections, and there were a lot of there were a lot of photographs also taken of um, after the social under the Social Security Administration after uh, 1935 of what was rural health um, in the South uh, and the problems and difficulties, and so the Warring Historical Library at the Medical Co Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston had a really nice clipping file uh, on Maud Callan in Berkeley County. But it was really just piecing it together, piecing it together. As far as Matilda Evans was concerned, um, some of the material was found in Martha uh, Schofield's papers um, because she really did. She loved Matilda because she represented the success of her school and all that she had had done. Uh, and so she, they wrote a lot about Dr. Evans, you know, a graduate of Schofield uh, School. And so that you could find some bits and pieces of information about her. And, um, and then the black newspaper. There was a black newspaper, the Palmetto Leader, and it was like an institution in the state of South Carolina. Um, and so um, you could piece together uh, some of the information from there. And they followed her because she was so successful. You would have thought there would have been a lot of envy and jealousy and whatever. Um, but her personality was such that people just respected her. And uh, the black male professionals even elected her uh, to, to lead the Palmetto Medical Association. Uh, uh, for a while as a you know, second vice president or anything like that. So it, that's why it's taken so long, you know, <laughs> years and years and years. Martha Schofield at least has an archive at the Friends you know, Library here, but these other women, very difficult. Yeah, John. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, I was just wondering as you went on about her and the incredible accomplishments, did she have any apprentices, assistants, trainees? Who, um, Matilda Evans? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about the last one. Maud Callan. Maud Callan. Well, either one. Oh, yeah. Or uh, many of those, uh, those, those midwives that you saw, that she was training that class, a lot of the midwives actually um, they came, were so inspired and their confidence uh, and their skills improved so much that they went to nursing school and became trained nurses, you know. So, um, and came back to South Carolina and, and began the process of delivering babies and improving the health care. So she inspired uh, a lot of, um, of people um, to seek higher professional uh, skills and, and degrees and training and then to span out across uh, the state and there are people there who still in South Carolina who still remember Maude and again Maude had another side to her. Uh, Maude was this no-nonsense woman and this one one elderly man was telling me about Maude Callan I was talking to him um, 
But a woman told me the same story, that when they were little kids at those, you know, back, uh, those schoolhouses and what have you, and Ma would come in and they'd have to all line up because she was going to inoculate them. And of course, the kids were scared of the needles and whatever, and they'd come in and they'd be crying and come up to her and she would look at them and she would say, if you cry, I'm going to stick this needle in your tongue. <laughs> she said, so he said, nobody would cry after that. <laughs> she was just, uh, of course she wasn't going to do anything like that, but it was, she just had, again, that kind of, we're going to get this done, this is the way we do it. These are the problems. This is the benefit that you will derive doing it my way. And, and that was it. And so after a while, anything that happened in Pineville, the first thing people would say is go get the nurse. They didn't even have to call, or, and, you know, if they were being respectful, they called her Miss Maud. So Miss Maud, the nurse. And she was always there for her. And kids still remember. Lord Callum, yes. I was wondering um, uh, uh, if you thought about these um, uh, hospitals. I mean, they're not just—they're not just dispensing medicine. They're, these women are, you know, giving these kids a political educate. I mean, they're educating the kids at the same time as they're—you know—they're dispensing advice and they're dispensing medicine. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it's an extraordinary story that you're telling, um, for a particular reason. You know, it, it sounds like, well, especially with. with um, uh, Matilda Evans, you know, that's one example of, of one of your subjects actually expressing her politics, but yes. you can see that going through the others as well, that they're, you know, that this is about medicine, it's about politics, and it's about, you know, teaching kids lessons, and I think that's, it's a... It's, it's really about reinforcing the importance of community, and of service, and of owing something to your to people and not expecting to always get you know rich from what you're doing but the importance of service of taking your skills of being the very very best you know there's no question about that these women had standards that far exceeded uh, in, any just rank of the file professional and this by their example they're instilling uh, uh, certain kinds of, of expectations in their in the people they're, they're serving um, and decades after their death this pe people are still remembering them and remembering them quite fondly um, they did learn something these, so there were social and political uh, lessons and so when the civil rights movement um, actually jump started why were so many people willing to suffer so, to give up all of what they had, um, to put their lives on the line? Uh, why were they willing to do all of this? Well, you have these community examples of a Matilda Evans and a Mark Callan. Matilda Evans never married, but she became a foster mother to about a dozen kids, four kids. And the same with um, Law, she fine. But um, again, using their resources to educate people. Now, back to Matilda Evans. Matilda Evans actually did send some of her nurses off to medical school and uh, helped to get them money the way Maud, I mean, Martha Schofield had gotten her money. So I do have a fragment of a letter of her uh, writing in support of a, of a nurse, one of the student nurses in her hospital, saying how gifted she was and what a, how extraordinary she was. And in the letter, sort of self-serving in a sense, she's saying, and I turned out so wonderful and so great, and I have a fabulous career, and I'm doing whatever, and if you help her, she will, have the, she will be the same way. Uh, Elizabeth Vanderwall, I think that's her name. So she did, she did help identify <laughs> talent and train people. Any other, uh, the last question and then I think we have a reception over here.
Okay. Yes, maybe a quick, I'm just wondering, and it's sort of um, after what Judy said, was there any white resistance? Did, did was there any ever? And were these women ever subjected to? That's the beauty of it. These women are tra they're transgressing all over the place, but they are so such skilled performers. They know how to feed expectations, how to play into those stereotypes when they have to, but how to be subversive in their own own way. And so, the white media lauded these women in terms that you never see, uh, you know, Southern presses write about, uh, in print, about black women. And, and so my question is, because I'm doing this microscopic study, this is really a, micro, a microscopic kind of, uh, kind of investigation, are there counterparts of Matilda Evans and Maude Cowan in other southern states. You know? Is this something, as group of scholars, we need to be looking for those instances where, given segregation and Jim Crow, white and black professional women actually formed alliances to help mediate social and health care, social welfare and health care uh, problems within their communities. You know? And how do we go about then taking this microcosmic study and investigating all the other uh, uh, states in, in the South uh, during the era of Jim Crow to find where white and blacks are finding common ground. What about through the Shepherd Towner Act, the, sh the visiting nurses, where they, were they, they were, uh, were, there were women of color who were hired through the Shepherd, Shepherd Towner Act nurses? Um, Maude Callen um, talked about it a little bit, but that act was rescinded in 1929. Yeah, it was short. So very short-lived, and it was during that act, that act actually, um, ignited this whole movement in some ways to get rid of all of the um, of the midwives because Shepherd Towner was supporting public health nurses, you know, people with degrees and what have you, and um, and 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 most of the black women who were in the in the uh, birth delivering business were not licensed or trained nurses. And so Shepherd Towner said, well, let's have some institutes and train them. And, but only the public health nurses could you know, train them. And then when they pulled the plug, uh, by that time everybody was convinced that midwives were the responsible parties for all the death of mothers and babies in these southern communities. So I'm glad you uh, brought that up. Thank